So we finished up the last episode in this series on building guitar number 85 with installing the black white black dyed fiber strips and the mother of pearl into our rosette channel. And then the last thing that we did was cut out the sound hole. So that is where we will be picking up today. For my soundboard bracing, I'm starting out with my two X-brace arms and creating a lap joint so that they can interlock together. Now, we've covered this quite a bit, this process of creating lap joints, in the first part of this series where I created a lattice bracing pattern for the back plate. So, I'm going to kind of speed through this part of the process here and actually I'm going to speed through most of the installation of the braces so we can get straight to some more interesting stuff as far as carving the braces and all that comes after. All right, so we're gonna start by breaking out our chisel and carving the X brace arms. So I've clamped the soundboard down to my radius dish. It's a good idea to do your carving work in the radius dish simply because now that the braces are glued and attached to the soundboard, they are pulling the soundboard into that 30 foot radius. So if you simply do your carving on a flat workbench, you risk cracking your top by trying to force it against a flat surface. After all the tapers are carved for the X brace arms and all the other braces as well, I then turn my attention to profiling the braces. So what I'm doing there is I'm giving all of the braces a pyramidal profile. Now I start by pre-carving out the center of the X because that inside corner is a little tricky to get into. Hey guys, so I just reached the final voice on the soundboard here. And let's go ahead and check this out for a second. Because everybody's always interested in voicing, of course, as you should be. Um, and just as a caveat here, voicing is really a process that encompasses or is, is touched upon throughout the build process. It starts at the beginning when you're sourcing the materials and dimensioning them early on, and it kind of ends right here, uh, right before we attach this to the rest of the body. And so you're not gonna be able to hear this on there. Uh, you'd basically have to be here and you'd have to have this up to your ear, but Here, I'll turn like this and, I don't know, maybe you'll hear it. <laughs> but really, in a nutshell, all of this is truly about flexing. So using your tactile senses there, listening, as I was just doing, and even looking, um, because in the back of your mind, if you do many guitars, you should have a little bit of a mental log of what things should sound like, feel like, and look like. There should be, you don't from one 
guitar to another, if you're doing the pattern and everything else the same, even if you're switching woods, it shouldn't look radically different. But essentially what I'm trying to do is once I get this in the ballpark where I'm getting a nice resonant tone that rings out for a long enough duration, once I get to that ballpark state, then I'm just making sure that the distribution of stiffness across the whole plate just by kind of tapping around and that flexing, which is probably the more important part, I spend more time flexing than I do tapping, um, until it feels and sounds about the same all over. It's a bit of a tricky process because you have to keep in mind that there's an enormous, well two enormous braces that aren't on here right now. The bridge itself, right, which goes right over the bridge plate, that's a huge brace. And then even bigger is the perimeter of the sides all the way around, right? So that's going to be a massive brace that affects everything from the edges inward. It's going to stiffen that up. But again, like I said, it's more about having that mental, no matter how you do this, it's about having that mental uh, backlog of experiences from building other guitars and building upon that as you go. So there you have it. That's uh, in a nutshell, voicing. Now let's get back to building. So before we can close the sound box, I'm going to sign my label and install it. So there's my label on a uh, printed piece of parchment paper is what I use. And it's really not something that I've put a whole lot of thought into and I think at some point maybe I should. As, at least as far as the, uh, the materials that I use and the technique for sticking it in there, I literally just glue it down. I always tend to get a little bit of wrinkles and bubbles in there when I'm placing it. And uh, there's probably a better way. But, um, I don't know, I guess I'm too focused on building, but this is a nice little touch and I should take the time to make it perfect. Anyway, that's just my thoughts on my own little self-reflection on my label making process. Also at this point, I'm going to be signing the top with a fine tipped Sharpie. Okay, and now back to the grind. Uh, I mean that literally, because I am grinding out the notches for the X-brace arms and the transverse bar so that the kerfing can accept those structural braces. You saw me do this in the first part of this series with the back plate. And a pivotal moment here, I am gluing the top plate and thus closing the sound box. After letting this sit overnight to cure, I'm now ready to route off the excess trim around the top and the back plate. I'm using a laminate router with a flush trim bit so that that bearing on the flush trim bit can perfectly follow the outline of the sides. The next thing I need to do is make sure that the sides are meticulously flat and square and I've leveled out any little dimples or 
depressions or anything like that. The reason we need our sides to be meticulously flat and square is because the work we're going to do on cutting our binding channels relies on the sides being flat and square because similar to how we just used a flush trim bit to route the trim off, later on we will be using a similar but mm, a bit more complicated setup to do the same thing but actually cutting in slightly to make our binding purfling ledge. And if your sides are wonky, then your binding purfling channels will be wonky as well. Okay, so here we are, ready to get into some serious binding work right now. I've gone ahead and made this little mock-up of a binding purfling ledge. And the reason for that is because I wasn't quite sure exactly what I wanted to do here. And whenever that's the case, you can make a little mock-up like this, just with super glue, and check it just to see how things are going to turn out. Um, in this case, I wanted it to work well with the rosette that I did. Now, one thing that I found that I wanted to do here was add this thin little purfling strip onto the side. So we're actually gonna have side purfling, which I didn't really account for in the beginning when I bent these sides. That's okay. I have plenty of other guitars that I can use these binding strips for. So, in order to get that side purfling on there, I actually have to start from the beginning here before I bent these. And with these unbent strips, I'm going to glue the side purfling onto the bottom and then bend them. Otherwise, there's just no real way to get the side purfling onto the already bent strips. Just wanted to cue you guys in on that, so we're actually going back a step right now. These will be applied to a new guitar, and we're going to attach the purfling to the unbent ebony strip. For this process, I have purpose-built jigs that are very similar to the concept behind a joining board, which you would use for book matching the plates. Through a similar process, I can get this thin purfling strip onto the edge of the binding. Hey guys, while those binding strips are in the bender, I went ahead and started work on the end wedge here, which needs to be taken care of before I start cutting the binding channels anyway. I have a template here and my router over here with a guide bushing. The guide bushing follows the template. As long as this is all aligned correctly, I get a nice perfect slot for my end wedge here. This little piece of equipment here that you see installed onto the guitar is uh, called the edge vise. It is a part of the luthier tool neck angle jig. I like to repurpose this to use it also for my end wedge here. The luthier tool neck angle jig is an awesome tool if you're very serious about getting your neck angles right. I say very serious simply because it's a very expensive and professional piece of equipment. Um, and as a little side benefit, it really speeds up and does really clean work on your end wedges as well. I have no affiliation with Luthier Tool, just like the product. Okay, so that looks good, nice and clean with no gaps. So I'm gonna go ahead and glue this down.
Alright, time to cut some binding channels. In some cases with difficult woods, I will score out certain areas of the cut ahead of time with a little tool called a grommel. Most of the time, however, I don't actually do this. And if you're just using Sitka spruce and it's very uniform, then it's probably not necessary most of the time. But as a precaution, it never hurts to do it. Now on to cutting the channels. Grain direction is very important here, and I start by doing my conventional cuts first. The conventional cuts are only in the areas where the rotation of the bit doesn't allow the bit to bite into and get under the grain and tear out a chunk. Once I've cleaned up those particular areas, then I can go in the climb cutting direction around the rest of the guitar. So that cut I just made was for the purfling ledge. Now this second binding tower that you see off to the bottom of the screen, I have set up for my binding ledge. This is just one way for me to speed things up and make things more efficient in my shop by dedicating two different binding tower setups, one for the purfling ledge and one for the binding ledge. And now I do pretty much the same thing for the back side. So when I ran this whole thing through the router setup, I intentionally left the area around the end wedge untouched. Now the reason for that is because I know that we are doing side purfling on this guitar. And there are some miters between those purfling strips that I have to cut by hand to do them right. So that's what you see me doing now with a combination of a small eighth inch chisel and a grommel, which we talked about earlier. Alright ladies and gentlemen, I think we've covered a lot of good ground here and we'll be starting off in the next episode installing our mother of pearl purfling and binding scheme. See you in the next one. Bye for now. If you learned something here, please give this video a like and subscribe so you can be notified when I release a new DIY guitar making video. And if you want to really learn more, take one of my structured online courses at ericschaferguitars.com or register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville, Pennsylvania.